of Post Corn Toastings welcomes you to the house of mystery. By October 31st, 1948, the Mutual Broadcasting System's flagship WOR in New York was approaching its 27th anniversary. It was argued that no station matched its signal coverage. WOR Mutual was known for its cop shows, soap operas, and on Sundays, its mysteries. At 4 p.m. Eastern Time, House of Mystery signed on for General Foods. John Griggs was Roger Elliott, ghost hunter and scientist of the supernatural. The show was directed by Olga Drus, who guided the program along a fine line. Because House of Mystery was geared for children, it couldn't be overly gruesome or vulgar. I'm glad to hear it. I hope you're all remembering to stay outdoors as much as you can. Getting lots of air, sunlight, and exercise. Yeah, and uh, postcorn toasty. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, Johnny. I don't think I understand that. Well, that's easy. Get lots of air, sunshine, exercise, and postcorn toasty. I thought you said your mother wouldn't take postcorn toasties on picnics. Well, uh, at first she wouldn't. But you found a way. Yeah, <laughs> I found a way, all right. Without dishes and spoons, too, Mr. Enham. Well, how can you eat post-corn toasties without a bowl and a spoon? Uh, you give up? I give up. Right out of the fresh protector box. Uh, just like uh, post-corn toasties was uh, nuts. Or candy or popcorn. Post-corn toasties are delicious that way. That's a wonderful yeah. idea. No fuss, no bother, but still you can take post-corn toasties with you on your picnic, automobile trips, or swimming parties. Just tuck a fresh protector box of post-corn toasties in with your luggage and eat those tender, crisp, golden brown flakes as you would nuts or candy right out of the box. And you can be sure of one thing. The special fresh protector box will keep post-corn toasties fresh and crisp until the last golden flake has been eaten. Thank you, Ruth and Johnny, for a wonderful suggestion. Oh, that's okay. And now I see it's time for today's Miss. The story I call A Gift from the Dead. It began in a hotel in San Francisco where I'd taken a room to wait for Paul Sheldon, an old friend of mine who was flying in from Kansas City to join me. Some weeks ago, Paul and I had been invited by his sister, Jane Koberak, to spend a few days at her home in the beautiful but rugged Big Sur country, 150 miles south of San Francisco. We'd accepted Jane's invitation with enthusiasm as evidence of her complete recovery from the shock of her husband's death. For my thoughts were miles away when the bellboy knocked on my door and handed me a letter. It was from Jane. I opened it and began to read but I was hardly beyond the first line when a vague feeling of uneasiness crept over me. The note was brief and to the point. She was canceling her invitation. As the day wore on, I reread the letter several times, each time feeling more uneasy. And by afternoon, I found myself pacing restlessly back and forth, impatient for Paul's arrival. I was about to leave for the airport to meet his plane when a long-distance telephone call stopped me. It was a woman, her voice tight with panic. Mr. Roger Elliott? Yes? Who's this? My name is Craig, Miss Alma Craig. Yes? I'm Mrs. Kovrak's housekeeper. I see. Mr. Elliott, you must come at once. Mrs. Kovrak needs help. But I just got a letter from her canceling the invitation. I know that's why I'm calling. We're in danger, Mr. Elliott. You must come. What kind of danger, Miss Craig? The master of this house has returned. We've heard him. He's here. Basil Kovrak has come back. Mr. Elliot, he's come back from the dead. And with a sharp click of the receiver, Miss Craig's voice was gone. Something had to be done, and quickly. I packed my bag, checked out of the hotel, and drove at once to the airport. Paul's plane landed as I arrived, and from the gate I watched the passengers unload. As Paul hurried toward me, a messenger handed him a telegram. He stopped to read it, and the smile of greeting quickly vanished from his face. I went through the gate to meet him. 
Roger, read this. It's from James. Paul, am canceling invitation. Please do not come. Explanation follows. James. What do you make of it, Roger? I fly over 2,000 miles to visit her, and then she tells me to stay away. Well, you're not going to. We're going to see James, and I think we'd better hurry. A bank of heavy clouds hung over the ocean to the west as we turned onto Highway 101 and started toward the Big Sur country. As the miles clicked by, I told Paul about the letter I had received from Jane and the frantic phone call from her housekeeper. When I repeated what she'd told me about Basil Kovarak, Paul's eyes grew hard, and he spoke with an undertone of bitterness. Roger, I opposed that marriage from the first moment I met Basil Kovarak. I could understand why Jane was so completely infatuated. He was handsome, wealthy, and thoroughly educated, but to me there was something cold and brutal about him. Something odd and difficult to define. And he was proud, almost insanely proud. Well, the Kovarak name is an old one. A titled European family, wasn't it? Yes, Basil was a count or something. The last heir, I believe. Well, immediately after the marriage, he took Jane to live in the house where she is now. Oh, it's a strange place, Roger. Huge and rambling. Perched on a cliff overlooking the sea. Nothing modern in it except the telephone. Kovarak kept it exactly like a like an ancient feudal castle. Well, was he in business, Paul? How did he spend his time? Well, near as I can tell, he devoted all of it to preserving the Kovarak family traditions. He had no other interests. He and Jane lived there alone. No one else but the two servants, Miss Craig and a handyman, was ever permitted on the place. Not even I. That's strange. Certainly doesn't sound like Jane. Ah, oh, she's changed, Roger. Why, when they'd been married about three years, I visited her unexpectedly. And would you believe it? She refused to see me. Sent word she wasn't feeling well. But I saw Basil. He came out of his library while I was waiting at the door. He looked at me with those strange, dark eyes of his. Then he approached me. I got the coldest reception of my life. Mr. Paul Sheldon. Hello, Basil. You've come to see my wife, I presume. Yes, I plan to see my sister. Mrs. Kovarek does not wish to be disturbed. And I, for my part, do not wish the routine of my household disrupted. We have nothing in common here with the outside world, and it is not our wish to change. But I don't understand. I've There's come a no long need way. to pursue the matter further, Mrs. Kovarak, and I do not wish to be intruded upon. Miss Craig, please show Mr. Sheldon out. <laughs> Oh, there was nothing for me to do but go away. And that's a pretty accurate picture of Basil Kovrak, Roger. He had Jane so completely cowed that she saw no one. Even her letters became stiff and cold. Well, Paul, you said Basil died a year ago. How? It seems that he and the handyman, a fellow named Christopher, were both killed when their car plunged over a cliff and fell into the sea. And, Roger, I'll say this. If it's possible for any man to come back from the dead, that man would be Basil Kovarak. Paul fell silent. It was dark when we reached the coast of Monterey, and soon the road became a shelf with the Pacific Ocean far below on the right and the Santa Lucia Mountains rising sharply on the left. The highway twisted painfully along the jagged coast. And then I saw it. The house built by Basil Kovarak, hunched up from the granite that surrounded it like a malignant fungus growing out of the stone. It was dark and seemingly deserted. We stopped the car, got out, and ran up a path to the entrance. Paul was about to knock when the heavy door inched open. Miss Craig? Oh, thank heaven it's you, Mr. Sheldon. And... Uh, this is Roger Elliott. Hello, Miss Craig. Oh, Mr. Elliott, it was wrong of me to call you. My mistress has ordered that no one be admitted. I don't know what to do. I'm sure it was wrong of me well, to call you. don't worry. You did the right thing, Miss Craig. How is my sister? She's all right, isn't she? Well, sir, she's Miss hardly... Craig, you don't oh. have to talk. Hello, sis. Jane. I turned and saw a woman standing in a wide hallway with a lamp in her hand. For a long moment, I stared. 
refusing to believe that this could be Jane Sheldon. She was drawn and thin. The muscles of her face were held firm against any show of emotion, but her eyes glistened with a cold, unspoken terror. Oh, Roger, didn't you get my message? Yes, as a matter of fact, Jane, that's why we came. Miss Craig, leave us at once, please. Very well. I'll be in my room if you want me. Paul, you and Roger must leave at once. Now, Jane, we want to help you, and if you'll forgive me, you look as if you need it. I... I don't want your help. You told me you were fixing the house over, but everything's exactly as Basil always kept it. Yes, except the cat. Cat? Basil had a pair of Siamese cats. He loved them, and I gave them away after he was buried. Now I can't locate them. And Basil's coming back. Jane, dear, please. Basil Kovarek is dead. He's coming back, I tell you. Tomorrow's our wedding anniversary, and he's coming back. But, Jane, you saw him buried. Surely you don't think... Listen. What's that? Hold it. What music? What was it? The jewel box. The Kovrak jewel box. Basil is in this house right now. Jane was terrified. She swayed and almost fainted as Paul and I helped her to a chair. Now, when she'd recovered, we urged her to tell us what was troubling her. She spoke slowly as if she dreaded the sound of her own voice. That music you heard is the Kovarak music box. It was filled with cut gems when Basil gave it to me. The day he died, it disappeared, and now he's brought it. Jane, will you tell us exactly what happened the day he gave you the jewels? Well, Miss Craig and Christopher had gone to town for supplies. I was sitting outside on the terrace when Basil called me into the library. I went in, and on the desk was an exquisitely carved casket I'd never seen before. He closed the door and looked at me a long time before he spoke. We are alone, Jane. I'm going to show you something, an inviolable secret. Promise me you will keep it always. Of course. Today is our fifth wedding anniversary. In token of the occasion, I make you this gift. Oh, it's beautiful. One moment, Jane, before you open it. Contained in this box is the lifeblood of the Kovarak family. The key to Kovarak wealth and power. It is a grave responsibility. You may open it now. <gasps> Jewels! Yes. Look at them, Jane. Sparkling and flashing. See, they blaze with a life all their own. The undying fire in those stones has been the symbol of immortality for countless generations of my ancestors. The jewels are yours now. And through them, you are bound forever to the Kovarak. They must be priceless. Oh, I'm afraid to keep them here. We must put them in a vault. No. They will stay here in this house, under your care. But Basil is so valuable, I'd it's be afraid. It's a timeless tradition that the wife of the Kovarak heir keep the casket of jewels. We will not break that tradition. Someday you may come to realize in what sense that box of precious stones means immortality to the Kovarak. Basil placed the box of gems in my hands and walked out of the library. I took the box to my room and hid it in the bottom of the trunk in my closet. And always before I went to bed, I checked to see if it was safe. After Basil's accident, I went to look at the jewel box. It was gone. A few nights ago, I'd heard it playing. Basil, the last of the Kovarex, was coming back from the grave. Jane was trembling as she finished her grim story. Paul tried to reassure his sister, but he was little comfort to her fear-ridden mind. The flickering lamp sent fantastic shadows dancing through the vast dark hall.